talk about. She's quite poor. Hello and welcome to my channel. My name is Ian. This channel is all about music and art. And a while ago, I ran a series of videos about how to start a record label. The complete set of videos, which is currently linked in the description down below. Now, the series started in May 2019 and the last video was part 28, which was a QA and a session uh, in November 2020. And now I was recently emailed by a viewer, Stephen, who had just started his record label. And Stephen asked if I was willing to answer some questions. So I'm going to attempt that. I must first say that I am no expert. Um, I'm just telling you how I would do something. I'm not saying that's right. And uh, you should always consult professional, advi professional advice if you need it. I also thought it was a good idea to update you on how things have been going for the last 10 months, really, with the label, the studio and everything through the pandemic. So I'll do that first and then we'll get over to answer Stephen's questions. Well, um, since my last label update, uh, not a lot has changed for Sinner's Music. The studio still can't accept clients or because it's too small, really. Uh, although we have somewhere to hire for group and large projects, um, but that does increase recording costs. I can accommodate solo artists here uh, and the studio is COVID compliant. We've got another room as well. Um, and it's also worth saying that just because the UK government has given up on the COVID restrictions, we at Cine Music don't feel that we should. The label has been fairly quiet. Uh, and although we've been working on new recordings with the Strayfield, which have just been played on BBC Introducing, which was great. And I've been working on tracks for a forthcoming album by The Wave Prophets. Uh, Sinners Music has also taken some new offices in a town a few miles away from the studio which will alleviate some of the space problems that we have. Um, we've basically only got studio and another room that we can use for vocals and things like that. But we should be moving there in a couple of weeks time. It's interesting to note that as part of the license agreement for a new office, we had to provide a business plan with current turnover, projected turnover for next year, along with me underwriting the rent payments because we're a limited company. And so on to Stephen's questions. I was first emailed after we just returned from reviewing the Edinburgh Festival Fins in Scotland, whereby Stephen wrote, Hi Sinners Music, I'm an artist from the North West in the UK, thinking about setting up my own independent small scale record label for myself and my friends. I have watched all of the video series and have found them so useful. It's actually the best content I've come across on the whole internet on this subject. Thanks very much, Stephen. Just tell your friends, tell everybody. I've been working on my business plan, which is good to hear, and everything is going good. I have a few questions regarding the business financial side of my independent record label, and was thinking maybe uh, you'd be the best to answer it, if that's okay. And he fully understands that we are not business advisors, but any advice is much appreciated. So happy to do that, really. So I replied to Stephen saying that, yes, I was happy to answer his questions. And before we get onto those questions, uh, I thought it was something I noticed in the original email was the fact that Stephen was setting up it for himself and his friends. And I think it's important to define the roles in a record label business. Stephen, are your friends going to be working with the label with you or are they just going to be your clients? Um, and make sure that you know where you are with that. Um, friends can sometimes think, oh yeah, well, when you've set up a label, I'll just have mates rates and that's, that's fine. But actually, you do need to be clear on every project that this is, you know, I, you need to be paid for this sort of stuff, really. So I would just watch that, make it clear with your friends that you know exactly what is happening and, you know, where their roles are. So on to Steve's questions. It's a small operation, literally distributing music from bands stream platform and that's okay he's planning to sell album cds and merchandise like t-shirts hoodies etc well selling cds and merch um, 
you'll need to finance the buying of stock. Uh, and that's why I tend to leave all of that sort of stuff to the band or the artist. It's worth mentioning that CD sales are small now. And I think bands and artists are going to sell more CDs at gigs than they are through websites. We have CDs available, but we don't sell many of them through our online output. It's mainly sold at gigs. Don't get involved with t-shirts much, although I, I'm thinking of getting involved in the Sinners Music t-shirt uh, range, but I won't. There's two ways of doing that. One is to buy the stock yourself and then just sell it through your websites. That, again, needs money to find, buy the stock, and you need to buy the stock in all sizes. So you probably need small, medium, large, extra large, maybe extra, extra large in every t-shirt, hoodie you sell, really. Um, so just be careful about that. There are these companies out there that will do, uh, they'll print this stuff on demand. Um, and I probably need to look at that sometime in the future. Um, I'm not sure how the big the market is for us with that sort of stuff. Um, it'd be quite. I have got some self-printed Sinner's Music T-shirts, or I quite like the one um, just that says Sinner on the front, and you know maybe Sinner's Music on the back, something like that. And I have got a Sinner's T-shirt like that. Vinyl is a bit niche, I would tend to say, uh, and you need to probably your, your the band or artists have to have quite a reasonable size following to make uh, vinyl worthwhile. Uh, I don't think it's particularly cheap to produce vinyl these days. Uh, those days have long gone. Uh, and it's something I've tended to stay away from. But if the band or artist feel that they can sell a thousand vinyl records, well, I'm happy to help them. But I, that's not something that I would get involved in, really. So all of the music uh, for Stephen's artists and bands are going to be self-produced no cost required on the production side i think that's great um and we do a mix of that sometimes we'll work with an artist and, and and actually just receive their their goods other times we um we'll be involved in recording it for them sometimes we're mixing and producing i always like to try and have it mastered elsewhere but if budgets are really tight i have also done that as well. It's worth mentioning as well that on occasion we've needed to reject tracks for an album uh, because it was the production wasn't up to it really um, and certainly if there's inconsistencies we've said you need, you need to go back and have this redone. Uh, also same goes for artwork we've rejected artwork in the past I remember we did the single with a chap and his first attempt which just really wasn't up to it really uh, and he did send it back. I mean you if you're going to put your name to it as a record label, you need to be happy with the, the stuff that's been produced. Is an accountant required even though low amounts of money transactions are moving through the company in a year? The selling of a few band t-shirts and one-off yearly distribution fees. I would say that any new business, if you've never set up a business before, you need an accountant. Certainly for the first couple of years. I've had, I've owned two businesses in my lifetime. The first one was a company called The Audio Clinic, which was a hi-fi retail store uh, and repair service. Um, now, certainly for the first three or four years, I had an accountant. Uh, we weren't a limited company. I was a sole trader. Um, it's cheaper. Accountancy bills are always cheaper if you're a sole trader. Um, it can still cost you, I don't know, two or three hundred quid a year. You know, it's really worth it at the beginning because you need to get the first few dealings with um, HRMC and all of that sort of. If you're VAT registered, get them to do your VAT at first. Once you're happy with all of that, I mean, I, I for the first few years of that business, the accountant did everything. They did the VAT, they did the uh, PAYE, they did my yearly accounts uh, and any dealings with you know the government is from a tax point of view um, 
I started doing my own VAT when they they put their uh, fees up to fifty pounds a quarter. So that's four times a year. That's two hundred quid a year just to do your VAT. Doing VAT is very straightforward, and if they've already done it before, then you, it's, it's it's you know it's you can pretty much follow on from what they've done. Um, and I'm happy to I'm actually happy to do uh, a video on dealing how I do my accounts, which will be different for an accountant, and how I deal with you know tax and VAT if people want to see that. So let us know in the comments down below if that if that's of interest. But certainly recommendation is you need to get an accountant right from the start. Um, if you're going to go for a limited company, uh, a, a friend of mine set up a limited company a couple of years ago and I think he's paying over the odds for his accountant. His accountant's doing everything but he's paying best part of a thousand pounds uh, a year I think for that accountant I think that's a bit steep I paid £600 when uh, I had my accountant last as a limited company um, um, I think that was plus VAT but we were VAT registered so we were able to get the VAT back um, but certainly five £600 is probably going to be the norm in the UK um, you can sometimes get extra services from your accountant, like if you want your if you want corporate house to have your um not your home address or your business address, you want to use your accountant's address, sometimes you can get that as part of the service. Again, they may charge extra for that. We never ever needed that sort of stuff. So, you know, your accountant, certainly the early part of a business, I would say is pretty crucial. So next question, um, do you have any advice on how to keep accounts uh, instead of using accounts? Like I say, I'm happy to do that with uh, a separate video, but it, and it would might be might be two or three videos to be honest, because it's not um, it's not straightforward. I mean, I find it, you know, I I, find, I keep on top of it, uh, and I'm happy to, sh to go through that if people want to see that really. Um, but let me know in the comments down below. If there's enough of you want to see that sort of stuff, I'm happy to do that. I'm also happy to do dealing with VAT. VAT is probably easier. Uh, I've just done my VAT accounts for the last quarter and it took me about an hour and a half this morning because everything else is pretty much well prepared. Uh, but I'm happy to go through that um, if you want to see it. Um, what's the next question? If registered as a limited company uh, for registering the name officially, can a PayPal account be used as an actual business account uh, or is an actual business account needed? You can't use a PayPal account uh, as a business a business account. I did chat to look this up because I thought, oh, that's an interesting question. And I didn't know the answers. Uh, you, need a, you need a business account, really. So, you know... I'm not hugely fond of banks generally, but they are a necessary evil. Um, I mean, in my first business, the audio clinic, I had uh, nine different bank account, nine different bank account managers in 10 years. Um, now, we went with that particular bank because of the first bank manager who was absolutely brilliant. She was only in that role for just over a year. And the, the bank managers got younger. Uh, and actually, bank managers know nothing about your business. Their role is to try and sell you services, to lend you money if you need it, um, um, and make sure that they can get the return for whatever you borrow. Um, you know, in those nine bank managers, it was only the first bank manager who actually visited the premises now i have to say this was back in the 1980s and um, things have changed so much bank managers will not come and visit your premises or come and talk to you even you have to go and talk to them um they'll probably want a business plan uh, i mean i did a, a very comprehensive business plan when we started uh, sinners music uh, and it literally was uh, it had demographic information and it had um, project, project, projected figures 
and turnover and profit and loss for I think five years um, and where we thought we could expand the business as we went forward. It was a pretty comprehensive um, business plan and I don't think any of the bank managers that we went to see. So this was 2012. Uh, I don't think any of the bank managers really looked at it. They thumbed through it, really, um, and then gave me it back. Um, I think they need to see that you thought about it, really. Um, and you need to do a business plan for that sort of stuff. You need to know where you think the money is going to go and where it's going to come in and where your pinch points in terms of, um, you know, needing extra finance if and all that sort of stuff you know so yeah and uh, you know in a new business you know you're starting that from scratch really you've got it's guess it's guess time but actually you need to do think about it be accurate as possible uh, i always worked on <coughs> excuse me i always worked on um best case medium case and worst case and i would do uh, a cash flow prediction pred prediction and turnover prediction for all of those um, and usually it was somewhere in the middle but you know you need to know what happens if you know if suddenly you've spent the money that came in and and things didn't work out like suddenly we had a pandemic and I was expecting a load of money to come in it didn't come in or those sales didn't happen because this happened you need to be able to think about that sort of stuff. Don't always look on the bright side. You know, that's not what how that's, you, you won't succeed. Believe the figures are, this, is, this might be an old figure now. I think I was told one in three businesses failed in the first year. It may be even worse than that now. I don't know. Uh, that's a sobering uh, figure, really. Banks will always tell you you're not borrowing enough money. Um, I mean, a good example is when we took we started Sinners Music, we, we needed a loan to buy the existing uh, music business, shop business. Um, so we wanted a loan, I think, of about uh, 10,000 in total at the time. The bank rates were so rubbish that it was better for me to go and take out a personal loan with Sainsbury's, who are pretending to be a bank, uh, and pay that back over two years, then take a bank loan. The bank loan, they insisted it was going to be over three years. The interest rates were so much higher. You want a low interest rate. If you can support the loan or have an unsecured loan, happy days, really. Um, don't use your house, if you've got a house, as collateral for a business loan. I have done that in the past with the first business. The real thing there is, if the business goes bust, they're going to come and take your house, and you don't want that. So don't do that, really. Um, so, yeah, you need a business bank. PayPal account is not good enough. Um, it's also worth mentioning that um, banks charge you money for just operating an account. We don't have an overdraft because we don't need one. Um you may need an overdraft if it's a new business. They're going to charge you for that. Uh, San, with, with Santander, who are just as bad as any other bank, really. Um, I can't. Even, I don't even know who my current bank manager is, really. Um, we did have one right at the start, but you know, uh, they charge back. Uh, Santander charge if you put cash in. So every thousand pounds of cash, we're not dealing with any cash at all now, but we were at the start of the business. For every thousand pounds of cash you put in, uh, they'll charge you a figure, a fee, five quid or whatever it is. Now, you know, the world has changed as far as cash. There's a lot less cash around, but it might be that you've got a cash business. They're going to charge you for, for banking that cash. So we tried not to bank cash as much as possible. We paid for things with cash. Like every time my insurance was due, I would pay my insurance agent, who was two doors down, in cash, um, you know, then it's somebody else's problem to deal with that amount of cash. Um, even though we don't have a, 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 um, any real charges on our bank account, uh, Santander still charges £7.50 per month, uh, every month. So that's what it's costing us 
So it's costing us 80, 90 quid a year just to run the bank account, you know, and it will cost you more if for, a, if for a newer business. So next question, uh, are there any legal processes to go through, cover or comply with when selling merchandise, t-shirts, hoodies? Every sale will need to be logged, question mark. Right, well, we don't get involved in selling t-shirts, um, selling merchandise, legal processes, I don't, not, not as far as I'm aware. You can buy stock, and we do buy stock. Um, it's not t-shirts, but we do buy stock. Uh, you can buy that stock. Um, you need to document everything. So you need to, um, we do it with, um, we have a, a daily spreadsheet. We have a VAT spreadsheet and I also have uh, accounting software. So every transaction we do coming in and out goes into each one of those spreadsheets software. So all of that is, so you document everything. Uh, but I don't think you need um, any particularly, uh, any legal processes to go through. You probably, you may need accounts. I mean, the way that we, if I, if we talk about um, the way that we do uh, our music instrument sales, that's probably the best way of describing it. It's not to do with the, the label, but it would be the same with CDs and that sort of stuff, really. We have accounts with companies uh, that we deal with. Um, they agree to sell us at a certain price. Um, we then can sell it, well, legally in the, in the UK now, you can sell it at whatever price you like, but it's an open market. So if I buy something from a supplier for a hundred quid and I want to sell it 150 quid, I can do, but my competitor may be selling it at 130 pounds. Am I going to sell it at 150 pounds? The way the world works now, probably not. I may need to come down to the same price as my competitor. So it's that's the sort of thing, really. Um, I mean, you, we have contracts with our suppliers, and if you're dealing with a t-shirt company or a company regularly from a, buying CDs, then you may have a contract with them, you know. Um, but generally, it's not it's not necessarily an issue. As I said, every sale will need to be logged. Every sale and every transaction. So every piece of uh, everything that comes into the business will need to be logged as well. If you are VAT registered, uh, you can claim back. Um, so all of this stuff in here, uh, we've claimed the VAT back on all of it. Okay. If we sell it, if I then decide to sell this off and we sell it a second hand because it would be, then we would have to pay VAT on that sale. That's the way that VAT works. Uh, so there is an advantage to to being VAT registered to some extent. Um, accountants don't seem to like it. Um, my accountant told me that I should deregister from that because I wasn't getting anywhere near the threshold. Um, and my friend who set up his business a couple of years ago, his accountant, he did, he was VAT registered, and then his accountant convinced him to deregister. Now the reality is because he's dealing with companies like me uh, who have to charge VAT, he's paying more for everything and he can't claim the VAT back. So if you're, if you're involved in sales and the sales get quite, you know, start to grow, then you will certainly need to be VAT registered, really. Unless it's a product that is automatically zero rated or exempt. Uh, and there are things out there that are like that. Um, Any more? So, um, what's your views on using Bandcamp as a place for selling merch and albums instead of through a website? I think Bandcamp is great. Uh, there's no upfront charges. Uh, we don't get many sales via Bandcamp because I think you need to drive customers to it. I mean, you'd need to drive customers to a website, but if you're able to sell your merchandise, CDs or whatever it is, uh, on say Amazon or eBay or Reverb, um, then 
I would do that too. I would sell your product, whatever your product is, on as many places as possible. So we currently sell all of our stuff um, on our own website, Amazon, eBay, Reverb. And then we've got um, digital streaming services, obviously, and we've got uh, Bandcamp, and we've also got uh, SoundCloud. Don't tend to sell some, anything through SoundCloud, but I believe you can. We use it for just putting up demos and things that are not going to be sold, really. We tend to use Bandcamp as a promotional tool and do pre-release stuff there before releasing... Um, an album or a single or an EP coming out on the streaming service. So the way that we do that is uh, we send out promotional emails for reviewers. We'll put we'll put the album up on Bandcamp, not do and do what's called a soft release. So we won't really talk about it in um, uh, in social media or any of that sort of business. We'll just put it up there. Um, we then will send out uh, releases to reviewers um, sending them a promotional uh, what's called a yum code um, yum codes i think you get 100 free and then you have to buy them i've seen more and more uh, promotional companies doing this with uh, dropbox and uh, google drive is the other one where as they put the album as mp3 files with all the promotional material in a folder that way you're not sending your reviewers product, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you're not filling up their inbox or their, with attachments. You're just sending them an email with some links to where they can get the code. Now, Bandcamp's quite useful for that, really. You know, if we're doing a small promotional run, of say 100, um, they get the album for free if they want it. If they don't use it, okay. And I, we do tend to document that, and you know, because you can find out who has used the YUM code and who hasn't really. So that's about it. Just one more thing. Uh, I have started to use something called Linktree. It's described as L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E. Um, and what is it? It's, it's a site that you can put all of your websites and all of your socials and all of your music in one place. And, so, and it's free, so it's worth using. So I hope that was useful. Good luck with the label, Stephen. Uh, I'm happy to do videos, as I said, on accounts, handling VAT, dealing with HRMC, all that sort of stuff. Although, again, I am no expert. I'm just, I would just show you how I deal with it. Um, if you find that useful, let us know in the links down below. Um, take care. It'd be great if you subscribe. That would be so nice. Uh, and thanks very much for watching. And I'll see you next time. Cheers now. Bye-bye.